our first lecture day. It was going to be really a two-part lecture uh, today uh, and also next Tuesday, which I think is the uh, January 19th. I'll have two lectures on the Reformation. Uh, I think the first one today is primarily going to cover about the background of the Reformation, like how it started, uh, like the early reformers and all that. I'll even get into the um, what they call the Catholic Reformation for a few minutes uh, as well. And then I think next week I'll get into like how the, how the um, Reformation kind of spawned like religious conflicts as well, like the Thirty Years' War, probably the main thing we'll talk about, uh, of course, uh, which is next week. So anyway, uh, yeah, I do have a PowerPoint lecture. Here, of course, here's the actual, you know, announcement about, you know, the lecture today. Now, that's where you, you know, look at all the links to it. Uh, and you saw I already kind of put up this little um, preview video. I think I'm going to try to do this for each lecture, have a preview video on like a lecture coming up. I did kind of use a little Monty Python <clears throat> short little video clip there about Martin, <clears throat> about Martin Luther. <clears throat> if you get that thing with that, um, Luther was one of the first um, <clears throat> priests of Mary, if you know about that. And I guess that's why he was checking out the women <laughs> and all that. That's what that was about. So um, let me bring up the PowerPoint lecture, of course, uh, for this um, lecture today. Now, I am doing something different uh, this um, semester. I'm probably not going to review, like, during my lectures. I am planning to um, probably have a review day of some type, like over the, like, study guide. I'm probably going to do that instead. So that's something I'm not planning to do this semester. So it, it just takes too long to do that. So I'll probably have, like, for our exams, I'll be probably reviewing, like, over the whole study guide. Uh, later. So, so you should have like a, a section on the Reformation. Uh, of course, this is located in that announcement, but you can also go to modules on Canvas and look, of course, uh, with the Reformation lecture uh, that I've got posted uh, right now. So really the first thing I want to talk about uh, with the Reformation, obviously you want like uh, kind of like a definition of um kind of what the Reformation is. Uh, there's like different ways that you can, you know, define, you know, like what was the Reformation, which is called all kinds of names. I do it's called Reformation or a lot of people use the term Protestant Reformation. Uh, they use it often like just call it the Reformation because uh, it was a Protestant one, but there was also a Catholic one. So that's why they kind of use that term just by itself alone. But primarily it was this um, religious split or schism that so you call it a revolution, maybe if you want that occurred in the uh, Western Christianity, and uh, <clears throat> um, what happened was um, because of like corruption in the Catholic Church, the church split uh, is what happened. And um, of course, I'll get into like all the different causes of it, but obviously from the video you saw. You know, Martin Luther was one of the main causes, you know, of why, you know, the Reformation uh, occurred. Uh, in fact, if you study about Martin Luther, Martin Luther, um, I've got a picture of Luther, which is right here. Luther, I think when they were talking about the uh, millennium, like from like 1000 to 2000, uh, they think Martin Luther was the most influential person. I think that in Johann Gutenberg, I think is the other one. They talk about the one and two together, you know, those two as being the most influential. And, um, oh, the Reformation, uh, I'll give you the dates on it, but it lasts from about 1570. That's what some people think it started uh, when Luther published his 95 theses. And it goes up to like, um, they think 1648 is kind of like the end date of it, of when the um, Thirty Years' War came to an end with the Treaty of Westphalia or piece of Westphalia, but they call it too as well. That's usually about the period of it. Although the ramifications of the Reformation keep going, like from the 17th, I guess, into the 18th century, uh, et cetera. But I think things become more secular in, like in Europe and other parts of the world, and it's not as big of a problem, like the Reformation. Um, now, what were some of the major causes of the Reformation breaking out? 
Well, they talked about the video, like all the problems in the medieval church um, that they had going back to, I guess, the um, high to high to late Middle Ages uh, and all that. I can give you a bunch of, you know, it's not in, I don't have any slides on that to give you, but uh, I can kind of talk briefly about, you know, some examples uh, of, of things that were really a cause of it. I know a lot of the clergy uh, were really untrained. Uh, they, they, you know, they, they, there were no seminaries or anything like that. Uh, so you had cases where some preachers were even illiterate, believe it or not. Um, you had cases where a lot of the uh, the preachers, a lot of the uh, priests, like the clergy, were um, not celibate. They had wives on the side, you know, and things like that, concubines or whatever. So you had that problem. Uh, as well. Uh, simony was a problem too. Simony, uh, spelled with a Y on the end, simony, uh, where they were buying and selling church offices. So some people were in the church, like some of the popes were in the church really for, for power, you know, not really for religious reasons, uh, more or less. Uh, of course, the big thing they always talk about, you know, that causes the Reformation to really break out is the issue of indulgences, the selling of indulgences that the little short video talked about. Uh, and uh, this was a major, major cause uh, of why uh, the Reformation occurred. Uh, I do have a little slide on it. I'll show you right here. But basically, here's a definition of what it was. Uh, it was a remission of punishment caused by sin. Uh, and um, usually uh, this was caused, uh, usually this was uh, a deal where like either, I guess one of your relatives, like, like one of your dead, rel like uncle or somebody, or maybe your dad died or something like that, and he's in purgatory. And you're not sure if he's going to go to heaven or not, or hell. Uh, and so you pay some money to the church uh, to have his sins forgiven uh, so he could then go to heaven. So that was the point of what it was about. Uh, and um, what set Martin Luther off um and uh, I'll kind of get more into who Martin Luther is. Let me first talk about who Luther was uh, first. Uh, a little background about him. Luther uh, was from uh, northern Germany. He was actually from Saxony. Uh, in, Saxony is kind of like a province in, or state that was in northern Germany. Uh, and um, actually, he wasn't supposed to even be a, like, a, like a priest, like in the church. Uh, I think he was going to be a lawyer or something like that. Uh, his father was some kind of, um, I think, a miner or something like that. You know, he had a mine or something like that and mine for stuff. But um, there's a story where he was 21. You know about this? Luther got struck by lightning. <laughs> After that, he decided to join the church, and he went on to become an Augustinian monk. And uh, over time, he got several degrees, and he was a theology professor at the University of Wittenberg. Uh, so he's like a professor like me. Uh, and anyway, there was this guy going around, I guess, in local parishes uh, named Johann Tetzel. You may have heard of him. He was like this Catholic preacher. And anyway, uh, Tetzel was selling like a lot of indulgences to people, like 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 it's hotcakes, you know, to <laughs> make a lot of money, I guess, uh, with this. A lot of the money was actually being collected to uh, rebuild uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It wasn't actually going to, I guess, people in the local parishes. And so this kind of infuriated Luther. Now, I think also Luther thought, you know, you can't buy your way into heaven, which he felt some people were kind of trying to do uh, with the whole indulgence. And so Luther took it upon himself uh, to publish, if you know about this, the so-called 95 Theses, which is a picture, kind of a picture right there on the right of uh, the 95 Theses. And the 95 Theses was this uh, academic disputation that was written in Latin uh, that he wrote up in 1517, which had 95 items in it written. And it basically criticized the whole practices of the, not just the church, uh, you know, practice of maybe selling indulgences, but maybe the, the corruption within the church itself uh, that went all the way up to the Pope. Oh, and so legend has it that it was posted to the front door of the local church in Wittenberg. Witten, they call, they call it the Wittenberg Church Castle, it was originally called. And um, I think it's called something else. It's now a Lutheran church now, which is funny. And um, there's actually a picture. I don't think it, I have a picture of the, of the actual door where they supposedly 
posted it. It's now called the thesis door. And uh, they're not sure if he actually did that though. Like he may have sent somebody to post it or something like that, but there's been like pictures of him, you know, hammering it into the actual door that probably didn't really happen. Uh, but it set off a firestorm, like within like a year or two, it, it, the, the, this uh, disputation he wrote went all the way up to the Pope, uh, who the Pope at the time, I'll give you him. Um, here's, of course, the picture of the 95 theses that Luther wrote. Uh, I went all up to this Pope named Pope Leo X. Uh, and, of course, he got real angry about the 95 theses. And at one point, he actually censored about 41 of them, actually banned it. Like where nobody could read almost half of it. Uh, and uh, he then sent a letter to uh, Luther, actually sent two of them at one point, uh, which are called a papal bull. Papal bull is like a um, type of um, church letter uh, that's sent directly easily to like a, um, like a clergyman within the church. And, um, Uh, they call it papal bull because uh, it comes from the word bulla, B-U-L-L-A, which is a um, Latin term for the seal that goes on the actual letter. And um, I think they issued two of them. Uh, I know the second one later basically excommunicated him, uh, which I think he was, I think he wrote it that summer of 1520. And Luther took the actual papal, papal bull. He actually burned it. Uh, that's what he did. He basically, of course, when he did that, you know, that pretty much is no going back. Uh, and uh, officially, he was excommunicated on January the 3rd, uh, 1521, uh, for, for writing the 95 Theses. And, uh, uh, and uh, there's a famous, um, I'll show it to you real quick here, but there's a famous site where uh, Luther burned the actual papal bull in Wittenberg in Germany, Saxony, and um, it's called the Lutherreich, uh, where they think he burned it. And um, they put a tree there. You see, they got, it's an oak tree, I think. I think Lutherreich means Luther, Luther oak, I think is what it means in German. And they think that's the date. December 10th, 1520 is the date he burned it. So I think some people think that maybe that's the date when the whole Reformation really started, uh, was when he burned it. Uh, because I guess it was like, you know, Caesar crossing the Rubicon, you know, when, when, when he pretty much <laughs> did that issue. Although they actually I get to it later, they actually gave him a chance to recant. They gave him a second chance, uh, if you know about that. Um, now, um, of course, what happened uh, because of the, um, oh, hey, Hope, what's going on? But because of that, uh, what occurred next uh, was that then you, because of Protestantism, you know, forms from that. So you get the Protestants start breaking away uh, because of what Luther does uh, at that point. And uh, the ideas of Luther and Lutheranism kind of form later uh, within so many years. And people that are, are, are trying to support Luther uh, begin protesting against the church. They thought that what the church was doing uh, was bad. Uh, and so those that were pro-Luther pro against the church became known as Protestants. Uh, those that were Catholic became Romanists. Those are the term I think they start using uh, in all of that. So they'll start breaking away um, in all that. Yeah, I see that. But anyway, um, so yeah, let me talk about what happened before I get into like more into Lutheranism, like what happened, what it is, and all that. But let me talk about what happened. Still, there was one more thing that happened though with Luther. If you know about this, uh, Luther was then um, sent before. I'll get to that later about Luther. Let me get into like and talk about what happened there with um, the Edict of Verbs first. We'll get into that because that happened April of fifteen twenty one. Well, Luther had one more chance. Um, he was brought before. Uh, what is the imperial diet of the Holy Roman Empire? That's what they called Germany in those days. And he met in front of uh, what is the ruler of Germany at the time, uh, who was, um, his name was, uh, bring him up, which is Charles V. 
Uh, he was the emperor of Germany. He was also the king of Spain uh, as well. They basically told Luther uh, to recant. Otherwise, we're going to declare you a, a heretic. Uh, and so I think they gave Luther like 60 days uh, to, to recant uh, his ideas, theology. And so uh, Charles V then issued what became known as the Edict of Worms, it was called. And what the Edict of Worms did was it banned uh, all of Luther's like writings. Uh, it declared him a heretic, you know, actually an outlaw within the empire. And anybody else that supported it, like anybody that supported Luther, uh, was basically, you know, got would get the same treatment uh, and all that. Uh, but what happened to Luther, um, what led to, I guess, the rise of Lutheranism and all that was he had all these different German princes that were throughout Germany. They began supporting him. And that's why the term Protestant came from. It was mostly the princes that supported Luther in, in the beginning. And then those that fought Lutheranism later and other branches of religion that were different from the Catholic faith uh, became known as Protestant uh, and all that. So, uh, yeah, Luther would go on, actually, to translate the Bible. He had something he did do. Uh, there's a famous castle called, um, I think it's called Wart Wartburg Castle. I think it's in northern Germany, uh, where um, he actually translated the New Testament in the German. Uh, I think he later did the Old Testament as well. Uh, and basically, like the German Bible and all that, uh, became widely available because of they talked about Gutenberg, you know, in the beginning of that little video. Uh, Gutenberg had developed the printing press in, in, in Europe, in Germany. And so it made like a lot of the Protestant theology easily available. And so that's why it spread so easily, you know, throughout throughout Europe uh, was because they could print it so fast uh, and all that. Uh, let me get into and talk about like Lutheranism. Like, what's the difference, you know, between uh, Luther Luther's movement uh, and all of that? Yeah, what as you know, Lutheranism would become like the first Protestant faith uh, that you'll basically have. So it, it starts forming first. It's the first Protestant one uh, that you have. Uh, they broke from a lot of the traditions, you know, of the Catholic Church. I'll get to it later, but they don't follow most of the sacraments uh, that are uh, in the Catholic church. Uh, they don't, you know, they don't believe in like the, uh, like the, um, like the saints and all that. And uh, there's not all this veneration worship of the Virgin Mary, I guess, as much like in some of the Protestant faiths uh, and some, some even uh, Protestant faiths don't even have clergy uh, later uh, as well. Um. In fact, Luther believed that you only need two things, uh, which was, you know, faith alone, scripture alone. He talks about that idea. And that's the only thing you need is salvation, you know, belief in Jesus and the Bible. Uh, you don't need the Pope. And uh, a lot of the Lutherans and, you know, Luther didn't think that the Pope really had any authority in Christianity because uh, only God did. Uh, it's believed in what, what was written in the Bible. Uh, and so on. So I think the uh, Protestants start talking about that whole justification by faith alone. That's one of the key things that uh, really is a big difference between uh, the Protestant faith and, you know, the Catholic faith. Uh, in the Catholic faith, they still think, you know, good works and missionary work and <clears throat> other things can lead to, you know, salvation and things like that. But uh, the Protestants only think that it's, you know, salvation and studying the Bible mostly. Uh, this slide also gives you a big difference, like between the two, like Lutheran versus Catholic, you know, kind of, you can see there uh, on the left, you can see yeah, mostly justification by faith alone. Uh, but in Catholic faith, this is not just about belief in God, but things you do in life, like works you do, to save your soul <clears throat> and things like that. Religious truth is in the Bible. Uh, religious truth is in the Bible and church and teaching. You see in the Catholic version there, on the right. Yeah, you can see in the Lutheran, like in a lot of Protestant faiths, uh, they mostly just kept two things, baptism and communion uh, was about it. Although a lot of times they call communion sometimes the Lord's Supper, if you know about that. In the Catholic faith, they kept all of them, the seven sacraments. Yeah, a local prince rules the church. And then, of course, on you can see on the other side, the head of the church is the Pope. So I think they wanted more local control 
It's one of the things that you start seeing uh, there. Priests can marry. You can see the clergy. Uh, the Catholics, of course, cannot. They have to be celibate. Uh, Lutheran, you can see the communion is also a little different. Uh, communion is the body and blood of Christ and the bread and wine. In the Catholic faith, communion is the body and blood of Christ. Uh, in fact, the Catholics think it was a miracle you know, that it converted the bread and the wine. And um, I'll get to it later. There's a lot of uh, a lot of controversy over the whole communion thing. Uh, Luther believed in what they call consubstantiation, which you may have heard of. Blood and wine undergo this spiritual change, uh, whereby Christ is, you know, present, uh, but the bread and the wine are not transformed. Uh, versus the Catholic Church transubstantiation, where they think it was transformed. The bread and wine actually became the body of, you know, the body and blood of Christ. Uh, and I'll get to it later. So some, you know, I think it was Ulrich Swing Lee is kind of like, eh, I don't know about that one either, consubstantiation. Uh, some some Protestants think it's only symbolic. Um, so it's kind of a big debate about that, uh, more or less. So we talked about that already. So, yeah, uh, that's some of the big differences, you know, between um, – the two faiths. And like I said, you know, like I was talking about um, how I think Luther was one of the first to like get married. Like we were talking about how, you know, the um, clergy were allowed to marry. It's something you start seeing uh, later. You know, Luther would go on actually to marry this woman named Katharina von Bora. who was actually a former nun. Yeah, she was. Uh, it's interesting about that. And that's why I had that little skit, you know, Monty Python skit, uh, talking about the Reformation and all that. He was checking out the women, you know, because oh, I get married, you know, good idea, you know. So anyway, have children, I guess. So uh, anyway, so I need to talk about next. So yeah, enough about Lutheranism uh, and all that. The other thing we need to talk about is also um, Calvinism is another thing that kind of also forms out of the uh, Reformation uh, that we have. It's, a form, it's another form of Protestantism that became real popular. In fact, it actually became, I think, more popular than uh, the Lutheran version of it, uh, believe it or not. And uh, Calvinism was a type of Protestant faith that was founded by John Calvin, who was actually French. Uh, it doesn't look like a French name. It looks English, but his real name was uh, Jean. I think it's, uh, it's pronounced, it's spelled different ways, but I believe it's usually spelled um Col Colvan, I believe, is one translation of it. Or I think another version is uh, Chauvin. It's spelled different ways. Or Coven, I think, is another way they spell it. I've also seen Colvin with an O instead of an, instead of an A. C-L-V-I-N or something like that. It's different spellings the way they have it. But the English, later, the British, you know, spell it later, you know, Calvin. And then, of course, Jean became John uh, over time. Uh, who was Calvin? Uh, Calvin was born around 1509 uh, in France. And uh, actually, he studied law. He was actually, I think, originally a lawyer, uh, believe it or not. Uh, but in the 1530s, he decided to become a Protestant. Have you heard about what Luther was doing uh, in Germany? And uh, he went on to um, write a um, theological work you see there called The Institutes of the Christian Religion which was published in 1536. Very important book, by the way. Uh, the um, Institutes was basically one of the first introductory type Protestant work on how to actually practice the religion. Some people think it was kind of like a textbook of Protestant theology, uh, more or less. It's where they got a lot of their beliefs from and practices uh, and so on. And uh, it made him uh, real popular with you know, Protestants in Europe. And so it, that work influenced a lot of people, especially in Britain, like in England, Scotland. Uh, they were heavily influenced by a lot of Calvinism uh, eventually over time. Although uh, Calvinism is actually sometimes called actually reformed Christianity, or their churches are sometimes called reformed churches. Uh, and I'll get to like the theology stuff in a second, but there's different, you know, different aspects of it, like the Anglican Church, I'll get to later, like the Church of England uh, is kind of influenced by it, uh, as you know, 
Uh, one of the most influential was Presbyterianism, uh, which formed later in Scotland by uh, this man named John Knox, uh, who actually met uh, John Calvin, because uh, Calvin, if you know about it, later fled to Switzerland. Uh, and um, Knox later went back to Scotland, formed his own church, uh, which is called the Church of Scotland or Presbyterian Church. And so they were heavily influenced by Calvinistic ideas uh, that would be there. You may have heard of the Puritans, right? Puritans, like in America, um, Puritanism, whatever. Uh, they were heavily influenced by Calvinism uh, in New England, like especially in Massachusetts, et cetera, so-called Bible common, what they sometimes nicknamed it. And um, they were very strictly, very religious, very, very, very religious strictness, you know, if you know about that, Puritans uh, overall, which you see that a lot too with the Oliver Cromwell period uh, in England when the Puritans got to take over after the English Civil War ended. Now, yeah, the um, Calvinists had like different theology. Uh, the two main things that they believed in were uh, predestination is something that they kind of believed in a lot. Uh, and uh, predestination was this idea where they believed that from the beginning of like the universe, like when God made the universe, he had already decided like, where people's souls were going to go, like heaven or hell. Because uh, a lot of Protestants didn't believe in a purgatory. Well, I think that you're either damned to hell or you're going to go to heaven. Uh, and I think there's even theories that they, you know, God's got a plan. You know, they, they God knows everything about you, your whole life, like who you're going to marry, uh, what kind of children you're going to have, what their names are going to be, <laughs> when you're going to die, how you're going to die, you know, and so on. It's crazy. Some people believe that. Uh, and also a lot of the uh, Protestants believe, like the Calvins, is that there were only a few people that were going to be saved. And they were called the elect. You know about this. Uh, so from the beginning of the universe, whatever, God already decided who's going to be saved. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, so um, and then theocracy, uh, the um, also another thing, too, was the. Um, Calvinists also uh, wanted more of a type of uh, society and government that was governed by God in religion. Uh, so uh, oftentimes they had like a, um, you know, like uh, church elders, you know, that would run run the state, uh, which happened in actually under Calvin. Like there's a, I think I've got a slide on this, uh, which was right here. Uh, but like, uh, not that slide, there's one right here where, um, Calvin uh, fled France and he went to uh, Switzerland, Geneva, and set up like a religious theocracy there. And uh, basically it was controlled by religious leaders. It's pretty much in religious laws. And so everyone had to go to church. Uh, you had to dress a certain way. Uh, you couldn't do certain things like game games or gambling, things that were considered, I guess, illegal in their religion. And any kind of violation of any kind of church religious rules, you know, could end up you getting punished or kicked out. You could be banished, uh, excommunicated or whatever. There's some case where people were actually executed, I think, for committing, you know, adultery or some kind of uh, crime against uh, their theological ideas that ran the state. Uh, this was actually later done, too, uh, in like England, like I said, under the. Puritans that ran like under Oliver Cromwell. Same thing under uh, happened under, of course, the Puritans in Massachusetts as well. I think today they still have something like that, sort of that kind of is left over, so-called blue laws, you know, where you can't buy alcohol on Sunday and things like that. It's kind of like a leftover thing from those days. But uh, Calvinism had a major influence, you know, on, on a lot of the theology like in Europe and in, in England, and then of course later in Amer the Americas, a lot of the religions uh, in the Americas were heavily influenced by by Calvinism. Now, I also want to talk about another famous uh, reformer that's well known, who was Ulrich Zwingli. You may have heard of Zwingli. Zwingli was another reformer who was actually in Switzerland, so he was a Swiss reformer, uh, and um, he didn't live as long compared to the other ones. He died in 1531. Uh, but they think he was kind of influential on uh, in the fact that he helped a lot of people in Switzerland start to break away 
and become Protestant, uh, not Catholic. Uh, in, that was in Zurich, where he kind of started his own movement. Of, I think they call it Zwingliism, I think is what his uh, version of Protestantism was uh, as well. Zwingli was the one of the first also like Luther to favor the idea that, you know, clergy didn't have to be celibate, that they could marry. Uh, so he actually, I think he went on, to, I forget who he married, but he married somebody too, uh, also as well. Uh, of course, one thing he was the first to do, they believe, uh, Zwingli wanted to get rid of the convents and monasteries and all that. So that's something he decided on and something you'll see later that Protestants want to get rid of too. I know in uh, in England they do that, like under Henry VIII, they get rid of convents and monasteries as an example. And then Zwingli, uh, if you know about it, got in this big clash with Martin Luther. They actually met each other, you know, about this. <laughs> and uh, they agreed on a lot of things, but the one thing they did not agree on was what to do about the communion, like the Lord's Supper. Uh, and you saw what, you know, Luther favored consubstantiation, uh, but Zwingli was against that. He thought that the Lord's Supper, you know, the bread and body of Christ and all that was only symbolic, that there was like no miracle. It wasn't even side by side with it or anything like that. And that's something that's kind of was a thorn in the side of Luther. I think that's important because they seem to think that helped to kind of divide up Protestantism more uh, later. Uh, and so because it's going to keep dividing, if you know about that Protestantism and they start breaking off into all these different sects and so on. So his was more puritanical for sure, uh, his version of Protestantism uh, that, that, of course, was created. Uh, then you have these other um, Protestants I want to mention about, which, of course, usually called Anabaptists uh, that existed. Uh, they're often part of the so-called, they call the Radical Reformation, uh, which also occurred in Europe starting in the 16th century. And these were radical Protestants that wanted to break away, not just from the Lutherans or Calvins, but the Catholic Church. And uh, they were kind of, they were hated by both sides. Like the Catholics and the Protestants didn't like them uh, either. They were considered like, I guess, too far radical for them. And so that's why they got, they, they use the term radical reformers or radical reformation uh, to basically describe them. They were different. Uh, the Anabaptists um, practiced a lot of things that were different from other people. One thing is they didn't believe they could, you could own private property. Uh, they abolished that. And so the Anabaptists may have been the first communists or socialists, you know, to, to do that. Uh, maybe that's where early communism came from, you know, back then. I think they even practiced some polygamy uh, where men might have multiple wives, I think, which is something that you couldn't do uh, back then. But the big thing that the um, Anabaptists did that were very famous uh, were um, they practiced this thing called uh, a believer's baptism, uh, which is where they got the name Anabaptist from. In fact, the name Anabaptist means um, rebaptizer or to be baptized again. And uh, they believe that you shouldn't be baptized until you're an adult, because uh, when you're an infant, you don't know what you're doing. Um, so you want to, you know, be an adult when you, I guess, uh, you know, become baptized, you know, so you know what you're doing with, you know, with Christ and so on. And uh, so groups like the uh, Mennonites, the Amish, uh, the Quakers, uh, those were kind of groups that were kind of grouped into what are called the Anabaptists uh, overall. And uh, yes, yeah, so you have some that are just called Anabaptists uh, as well. Uh, that exist in Europe and the Amer in America, uh, and um, we're probably more familiar with the Amish uh, more than any anything. If you go up to like Pennsylvania, Ohio, and other areas in the north, uh, overall, and of course, like Baptists today, like the Baptist movement, which didn't take off till later, um, was something that was influenced probably by the Anabaptists themselves. The idea of you know adult baptism uh, later instead of when you're an infant. Uh, then also you have, uh, I want to talk, and here's kind of a map showing you where, where the Anabaptists were about. So most of them were in Germany, uh, the Netherlands, and I think maybe in Switzerland would be the areas where they mostly were. Looks like some up in northern Poland looks like were up here as well, but most of them were in Germany. That's where they were. 
Also, I did want to talk about a little for today because I won't get into detail on it now, but the English Reformation uh, was also something that was another movement that broke away from the Catholic Church, as you've heard of it. Reformation, English Reformation started in the 1530s, uh, and it was started by Henry VIII, who you see a picture of uh, right there, the King of England. And, uh, of course, it would later call, be called different names, this church that Henry would form. Uh, it was called the Church of England. Uh, some people called the Anglican Church as well. Uh, the religious movement was called Anglicanism. Uh, and um, the reason why Henry broke from the church uh, had nothing to do with theology. It was more about Henry was concerned about whether he was going to uh, be able to have a male heir or not. Because uh, he had this wife, Catherine of Argonne from Spain, who had only given him like one daughter that had survived. And he was kind of fearful that Parliament wouldn't allow, you know, a female ruler. Uh, so he wanted to remarry. And that's pretty much the reason why the church was formed, because he wanted to annul the first marriage, uh, to remarry, to have a male heir. Uh, so it was more like political dynastic reasons of why the church got going. And as you know, later, I won't talk about today, but, you know, Henry will later go on to marry six different wives. That's what he's kind of real, real famous for, infamous for. It's kind of like a soap opera. And um, he only had one male heir that would actually survive. Uh, he was King Edward the Sixth. Uh, he became later the first Protestant king of England. Uh, but his brand of, um, like, at the if you study about the early English Reformation, it was like more like this Catholic version that Henry formed. Uh, it wasn't really Protestantism, not really, uh, or, or maybe it was a form of protesting against the Catholic Church, uh, more or less. But a lot of people called it Henrikian, Henrikian Catholicism, where basically he broke from the church and put himself as the head of the church instead of the Pope. And then he took over all the church lands, monasteries, convents, uh, and so on. And in a certain way, it was kind of like a power grab also as well to you know get wealthy off of the church, Catholic church. So uh, so after he would die, then you're going to start seeing, I'll get to it later, you'll see how uh, the church starts moving more towards the Protestant faith, like more towards Calvinism, uh, especially under uh, Edward VI. But I won't talk about that today. Um, like when I get to like talking about England or history of England, we'll get more into Reformation and what actually occurred because it does kind of go up to like you know Queen Elizabeth's reign. All right, I did want to talk about one more thing uh, today. Uh, here's another picture. I've got a slide there on that. So yeah, the divorce was really not a divorce annulment. That's pretty much what caused it. But um, I want to talk about the Catholic Reformation, uh, which is also called the cat. It's also called the Counter Reformation, which is what a lot of the Protestants called it in Europe originally. Now, the Catholics kind of went through their own Reformation. That's why they often call it the Reformation, because you get the Catholics kind of getting in there uh, as well. And uh, what was the Catholic Reformation? I can kind of give you a definition of it, but it was basically this movement by the Catholic Church uh, to kind of reaffirm their traditional ideas of the church, uh, it was also a resurgence movement to resurge against the Protestants. Uh, and it was also an attempt to stop the spread of Protestantism because people were starting to leave the church. They were trying to stop them you know, from doing that to get them back in, uh, you know. And so that's something that they had to try to do, try to make change to the church uh, to prevent people from leaving more and to maybe, you know, bring back the population to, want to like the church again. Uh, and um, the actual uh, Catholic Reformation, uh, it started really uh, in the 1540s. That's about, about when it got going. Some other things started before that. Uh, the 1540s seems to be the main period when it started. You can see in that picture at the top left there, the Pope that started was Pope Paul III. It was actually, I think, three popes that were involved in it, but he's the one that started it. And uh, he started with this uh, ecumenical council that met in northern Italy, uh, city of Trent, or also called Trento, they say it in Italy. 
And uh, they met over a period of like almost 20 years from 1545 to 1563. Uh, like the clergy within the church met uh, and they met to basically decide, you know, what they were going to do with the church. Like, I guess how to save it and also how to, you know, prevent the spread of Protestantism uh, and all that. And I've got like a list of different things that they, you know, did, you know, that were kind of part, I'll kind of go through a bunch of those uh, in a bit, but uh, the thing that they, I guess that first thing you're looking at right there, uh, that they pretty much kept was they kept all the sacraments, like all the seven, they didn't get rid of them. Uh, you know about that. Uh, and, uh, I know like in the uh, Protestant church, they were getting rid of most of them, except for, like I said, baptism and communion, uh, and all that, but they kept, kept the other ones. And, uh, then all the saints, they kept all of that, like the, the holy days of the saints, uh, and so on. Uh, the Virgin Mary, like veneration of Virgin Mary, something still big, you know, in the Catholic church, you always see people's houses with a little statue of, you know, Virgin Mary in the front or something like that for people that are Catholic. Um, so yeah, that, uh, that actually kind of made like those two, like the keeping the saints and the Virgin Mary kind of angered a lot of the Protestants, by the way, when they did that. Um, the Vulgate Bible, that's something else, of course, that's interesting about that. Uh, the church said that the only Bible that should be used is the Latin Bible, the one that was translated by St. Jerome, which I think was about close to the 5th century. Uh, so that, that became the only Bible they could use. So translations of the Bible were actually banned by the church. You had to read Latin, I guess, uh, pretty much. And so they didn't want anybody you know, to, to go. They kept all their masses, too, in Latin. So you couldn't have masses in, like, other languages. Uh, they wouldn't change that until the 20th century, uh, by the way, the Catholic Church. Uh, the church also banned people um, from reading certain books. There was actually a list of books called the Index Librorum Prohibitorum, or a list of prohibited books uh, that came out afterwards. They started banning certain people from reading certain authors, uh, which over time, I think from the pretty much from the 16th century up to the 20th century, they banned specific authors. Uh, you couldn't read them or anything like that. Not just Protestant works, but any kind of work that the church thought was heretical to the church's teachings and all that. I'll give you examples of, of people they, they banned. Uh, John Calvin, Rene Descartes, John Milton, John Locke, Montesquieu, Voltaire, Dennis, Dennis Diderot, David Hume, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, I heard of Galileo. Galileo was banned. Uh, Kepler was banned. John Kepler. Oh, Darwin was banned, but not the Darwin you think of. Erasmus Darwin. <laughs> they didn't ban Darwin, which is kind of weird. You, you think they would have, but that, that wasn't banned. And by the way, the, the banning of all these books lasted till 1966. Yeah, believe it or not. So yeah, I guess you can read anything you want now, but um, for a long time, they banned a lot of things. Uh, the Roman Catechism, that's something they developed, too, uh, in the uh, 16th century. That was basically the, you know, the list of the church's teachings and theology that they wanted Catholics to, to learn uh, about the religion. It was mostly set up for priests originally, but it's something that all you know, Catholics do now, uh, the Roman Catechism. And it's something that they pretty much developed to reform the church as well. Uh, seminaries were set up. That's something you see later, too. Uh, seminaries are created to, you know, train priests. Uh, they also began setting up a lot of church schools, uh, not just for priests, but for Catholics to go to school. So you start seeing that also. Uh, then you have something else, which is very famous uh, within, of course, the, Reform the Catholic Reformation. That was, of course, the famous uh, Jesuits formed. It's, they think born around 1540. Uh, and, um, often called the Society of Jesus. Uh, this was a Catholic order of priests that were directly under the Pope. And uh, they were formed mostly to uh, try and counter the Protestants, like in the Reformation, uh, to try to stop heresy uh, within the church. Uh, and uh, a lot of these, uh, of course, you know, priests uh, were, were sent all over the world. Uh, they were you know, set to do missionary work, uh, to set up churches, uh, to set up schools, universities, 
uh, to, you know, teach Catholics uh, and so on. And I did have a founder of it, uh, which was very famous. You may have heard of. His name is uh, Ignatius Loyola. You see there in the picture. And uh, Loyola was actually a former Spanish soldier uh, who became a, a priest uh, in the Catholic Church. He got wounded or something like that inside of come up, uh, join the church. And he went on to write a book. It was called The Spiritual Exercise. It became the basis of the whole order uh, in, in how it's run. And um, he later became one of its first leaders, which I think the uh, leader of the Jesuits is called a superior general. Uh, and they had two other men that also formed it with him. Uh, St. Francis Xavier, you may have heard of, and Peter Faber. They were also involved in, of course, creating the Jesuits uh, as well. And uh, they had a nickname. I don't have it in the slide, but uh, the Jesuits were often called the, um, actually, uh, I don't have it there, but the Jesuits were often called the soldiers of Christ because they were kind of seen as this militant type priests within the Catholic Church. And a lot of Protestants were scared of them, of the Jesuits, like, uh, I think England always talked about the Jesuits and all that. And uh, they were all over the place. They, they went into like the Americas, like South America, uh, to, to convert people. Uh, they went all over Europe. They went to Afri Africa. I think they went as far as like China and Japan. You had like, pro uh, I think Portuguese had Jesuits all the way over there uh, as well. So Jesuits were, were very, very powerful uh, you know, today the Pope, Pope Francis, as you know, uh, is a Jesuit. Yeah, yeah he is. Uh, so that shows you how powerful they still are, um, because even the Pope is a Jesuit uh, or a former Jesuit priest. I guess he, they never quit, I guess, that kind of deal. Oh, also, I did want to mention, too, as well, there was also this other order that kind of came out of the Reformation I'll mention. They had the Ursulines, you may have heard of, the Order of St. Ursula. I'll mention them real quick. Uh, that was like a Catholic order of nuns. Even the uh, nuns that uh, kind of formed their own Catholic orders or in the church as well. And uh, they were created to set up like schools uh, for uh, girls or women. Uh, and uh, they also ran like um, convents. It was named after St. Ursula, who was a saint in the Catholic church. And uh, actually in, um, I think if you study about uh, in New Orleans, there's a, school there called the Ursuline Academy that was founded in 1727. It's actually the oldest um, Catholic girls school uh, in, in, in the Americas. Uh, so, so that, so the Ursulines were, you know, there to obviously, um, you know, teach Catholic girls, you know, and also, I guess, train nuns, you know, things like that. So, so these are all things that, you know, are going on with, you know, the, the church at the time. Uh, and so, yeah, that's the beginning of the, you know, the Reformation where you got the Protestants doing their thing and then the Catholics are doing their thing. Uh, and so what ends up happening, which I'll get more into later, uh, is that it's going to spawn religious conflicts because you got, you know, Protestants like Lutheran, uh, Calvin, you know, fighting against Catholics. And uh, I'll talk later uh, next week about the 30 years war, the 30 years war. Uh, it's like the peak of the whole, you know, religious wars uh, that you have. Uh, and um, it was devastating, especially in Germany. It wiped out a good chunk of their population. Uh, so so next week uh, I'm planning to, like, I think it's on, uh, should be on Tuesday. It looks like the, um, I think it's January 19th. I'm going to have, of course, part two uh, on the Reformation uh, coming up. Uh, but uh, today, if you have any questions about this, I don't know if anybody had any questions today. I didn't see any questions, comments uh, in the lecture. Uh, you can let me know later. Uh, I think I told you that um, you can you can pretty much ask me any kind of comments, questions about the lecture uh, through my YouTube channel. If it's an administrative que question about like the class or something like that, uh, you just email me uh, about anything. But uh, I did want to remind you before we go today, uh, don't forget uh, to complete the pretest. Uh, that, that's due like Friday tomorrow. Uh, so that's, that counts as, you know, week one attendance. Uh, and then don't forget uh, as well, I think you've got a few other things, the contract policy page, you know, turn that in as soon as you can. Uh, also book reports, 
I want to know like what book you're doing uh, for your book report. Just email me that. And if anybody's interested in the, like I said, the um, that Veterans Royal History Project, just email me uh, about it. Uh, and that's pretty much it for today. So I guess I don't see any uh, comments, questions, uh, pretty much. Um, so uh, I'll see y'all later. I hope y'all have a good weekend uh, coming up. Hope this lecture was good for you. Uh, and um, that's it for now. So I'll, you'll probably see other announcements later about upcoming uh, lectures and events I'll have next week. Uh, don't forget Monday, Martin Luther King Day, no classes. At least I think so. So, so y'all take care. Have a good weekend.